Thanks, Larry. Herb Xbox Live's Major Nelson here with Pete Hines from Bethesda Software to celebrate Fallout 4. Pete, nice to see you. Good to see you as well. Now, you know I'm a fan of Fallout. When Fallout 3 came indeed. out, I played it over 100 hours, probably closer to 120, 130. So I know a lot of people are excited about Fallout 4. I'm really excited about Fallout 4. Tell us what we can expect with Fallout 4 in terms of some of the new enhancements. Um, I mean, at the core, what, what's fun about Fallout is, is the is the basics, right? It's this world that was that gets blown up, and, and you emerge into this this post-apocalyptic world that has its own that has its own unique vibe. There's a post-apocalyptic is now a big thing in entertainment, and there's lots of different takes on it. Uh, Fallout has a very unique one. It's worse than I thought. You're suffering from hunger-induced paranoia. Perhaps I can whip you up a snack. <laughs> Um, so you take that setting and that tone and that vibe and then you uh, let the player loose into it and let them do whatever they want. And I think a lot of the stuff that we've added to Fallout 4 is building on you know, previous Bethesda Game Studios titles like Skyrim, like Fallout 3, and figuring out more ways to give the player choice. One of the things from Fallout 3 that everyone remembers was this cr the crazy weapons you could craft. Mm -hmm. I assume we're going to have some of that in Fallout, Fallout 4 as well. For sure, yeah. There's a whole um, wide variety of weapons. All of the weapons in the game can be modified. Melee, guns, um, you know, so there's a core set of weapons. There's probably 50 or so, um, but then all of those basic types can be modified, modified in just a ridiculous number sure. of ways, depending on whether you want to take this pistol and make it more like a sniper uh, weapon, or you want to make it more for close range, and every mod has its sort of pluses and minuses. Um, in some cases, so you can decide you want to do more damage at a sacrifice for range or to less accurate but a wider spread on something like a shotgun. So again, it really sort of caters to you deciding how you want to play the game, how you want to modify your weapons, what, what kind of character um, you want to play, who you want to be, or you can ignore all that stuff. You don't have to build a mod at all. You can just, you know, buy and sell what you want, scavenge things from the world and, you know, find cool new stuff off of people and decide to use that. So. It's not, a, it's not a requirement. The, the game is always about you playing the way you want. You mentioned mods, and mods are a huge part. A different type of mods are a huge part of Bethesda and PC gaming. Yeah. And you were on stage, you guys were on stage at E3 this year announcing that mods are coming to Xbox One. That's really exciting. It's a, it's a big deal. It's something that, you know, Todd has talked about for years, since back on Morrowind in yeah. 2002. And, um, you, you know, wanting to... It's something we've always supported with all the BGS titles. Um, to do it in a way that's easy. You know, I get asked this a lot on, on social media and Twitter. This is not about what well, you have to have a PC and you have to do it yourself. The idea is you go to play the game, there's a menu option, you click on it, and there's just a bunch of stuff for you to download and you click on the stuff that you want and you start playing a game yeah. with these new mods. So we want it to be a really streamlined, fun experience. There's still specifics that we have to work out. It's part of our post-launch plan, but certainly something super excited um, for, for our fans and, and to be working with you guys on. I want to reel it back a little bit and talk about the gameplay itself. The VAT system, a huge part of Fallout 3. Mm -hmm. What have you done to enhance the VAT system for Fallout 4? Well, you know, the initial idea, um, and it was funny, you know, the seventh anniversary of Fallout 3 was this past past week or right? 10 days ago. Right? Um, and, uh, you know, one of the things I remembered was Emil Pagliarulo, who's the lead uh, designer of Fallout 3 and now Fallout 4, and, and Todd Howard, um, sort of acting out the idea of VATS before it was ever in the game, and they're sort of jumping around and it, it, you know, just, yeah, and like and do this, and then the guy's head blows off, and um, you know, the idea for for VATS was always to kind of heighten the experience of combat um, and to make it a little bit more tactical, where it wasn't always in real time. With Fallout 4, you still have that ability, but they've pushed it a little bit so that it no longer stops time. In Fallout 3, when you hit the VATS button, everything would freeze until you made all of your choices. Sure. Now things move in, a, in kind of a, a slow time state, so you still have the ability to do tactical, but you can't just sit there and do nothing forever. Like, guys are still attacking you, they're right. still shooting you, the mole rat is still trying to eat you, so... The death claw. Right, so you've <laughs> got time to be a little bit more tactical and strategic and figure out what targets you want to you know aim for and what body parts you want to aim for but there is a little bit of a time pressure there which I think helps just keep up the intensity of combat that it's not like a you can just press it and kind of sit back and be like okay I have however much time I need that you know the game is still demanding you make some choices and and, and, and take some actions and so it keeps up the pace and intensity of combat. When you made Fallout 3, and I was playing Fallout 3, I just remember those magical moments I would have where you're walking through the wasteland and you're, you know, you're walking for a minute or two and there's not much going on, you're picking up bottle caps, and then you encounter these, whether it's a small community of bandits mm -hmm. or, uh, we were just talking before earlier, 
about the spaceship that crashed. Mm -hmm. And you're like, what's going on here? Right. We expect more of those in Fallout. Absolutely. I mean, I think a big part of our of our games, when you look at the Elder Scrolls, and, and here in the case of Fallout, that the world itself is perhaps the most important character. One of the great things about Fallout 3 that, that I'm sure you remember is, is coming across like an abandoned house and going in there and some of just the like the immersive storytelling, yeah. like finding a, a skeleton in the bathtub with a toaster and an empty bottle of whiskey and just sort of being able to kind of chuckle to yourself at the story that just got told there. Nobody gave you any dialogue. Right. There wasn't anything to happen. That guy's not even alive, but you can kind of see the picture that the level designer is painting for you there of, of you know, this person coming to their to their obviously uh, intended demise. Right. There is so much stuff in our world. It's it's really mind boggling to the point where there's nobody on our team that knows everything that's in the game. There's right. simply too much. There's too much stuff. There's too many things that uh, that we've put into the game for anybody to know about all of it. So even for the devs, um, you know, who are making and putting this stuff right. in, they but still find things that surprise them. And I think that's. That's part of the fun is finding these stories, these characters, these factions, and and experiencing them, and they're all sort of standalone um, experiences that make the game more fun and make you feel rewarded for exploring and finding these things that are out there. You can see even just in the the tone for the world that Fallout Three, um, like I'm not sure we ever use the color blue, right? Uh, ever, um, and I'm exaggerating slightly, but not a lot. Like it was a very intentionally dark gray, depressing, and you'll notice the Fallout has got more color, that there's more um, there's opportunities for blue sky, and it, it's got this different feeling of not um, everything is horrible, and how are we ever going to make it, but the idea is that this is now home for mm -hmm. these people, and the world that was is almost kind of irrelevant to these folks. Right. Their, their reality is, yeah, this is where I live, and like this is my life, and we're going to make the best that we can of this, and so you get those little little glimpses of color, color, and almost a, a feeling of I don't know if hopeful is the right word, but it's a little bit more. It's not quite as pessimistic and dark, I think, as as you saw in, in Fallout Three. Well, what are some of the innovative areas that you looked at? Because you certainly could have said, "Oh, hey, we've got this great blueprint for success with Fallout Three, which was tremendously successful." Mm -hmm. What have you done to build on that in the areas that you've innovated? For, for Xbox. Sure, well one of the things that you know Todd Howard has talked about a lot as far as their approach is that every game gets treated sort of from scratch, that we don't walk into it um, thinking, well here are the things we're definitely, we have to keep, right. and then let's talk about it. everything sort of gets reevaluated and re-examined. There is no like, well obviously we're keeping this, or you know, so right. even something like VATS doesn't get the, like, well, obviously we're keeping VATS. It doesn't like, get a fast pass in. Right. <laughs> Everything gets evaluated, like, do we like how we did this? Is there something else we should do? Should we do more? Should we do less? Like, there's no kind of sacred cows. And I think that's part of his belief that you can get stale by sort of staying in in one spot or, or taking the safe route of not trying to change too much. And he really believes, look, everything has to be reevaluated and reexamined and keep the stuff that worked and improve the stuff that didn't or try new things. He really loved the idea of looking at games like Minecraft, which I'm pretty sure you're familiar with. Yes. Um, and how much people love just jumping in and taking the world and recreating it in their image and him thinking like, well, we already do crafting and, and the team wanting to say, well, what can we do so that it's not just, you know, a scope for your gun or or a, a larger uh, a larger clip for your for your 10 millimeter, but like your house isn't just a house that we give you. Like, it's a space that we say build whatever you want, and and not like well press this button on a menu and then walk away. And when you come back, this house will have magically right. appeared. Like no, you do it. You right. put the walls down. You put the floor down. Decide what kind of roof you want. What furniture is going to go in there? And doing that all in real time in these predefined places, which are by the way all over the world. It's not like the entire world can be built. But there are big, large areas all over the world that you can decide, you know what, this is a spot that I'm going to try and, and rebuild and, and, and do develop. some stuff to. And, and you can, again, do that or not. But the ability to do that and like just how crazy you can go with that, I think is difficult for you to appreciate until you get into the game and you start to realize, like, oh, I might mess with this. Oh, I might mess with that. And next thing you know, you haven't gone anywhere in the last three hours because you're right. building pumps for water and stringing up power for generators because you, you, know, you just wanted to hook that TV up to something and see what happens when the TV gets power. Um, it's, that kind of, it's that kind of sort of pushing the boundaries of what you can expect in a role-playing game and allowing you to, to kind of rebuild the world um, that I think makes the game um, 
really different. And you know, the big thing that again is a, it's just a feel thing, but I've already talked to quite a few folks who have played the game and, and, and commented on this to me is how different the gunplay feels. Yeah. Now it is super important. It is a game ultimately that most folks are gonna choose to go shoot guys and fight raiders and, and just how much different and better the gunplay feels when you're firing a submachine gun or a shotgun. It's something they spent a lot of time on. They worked with the id guys to talk to them about making the, the guns feel more they responsive. they know a thing or two about the weapons. The guys know a little bit about how to make a weapon feel like a weapon. So, it, you know, that's not the kind of stuff that folks usually ask about. You know, they want to know about like big feature stuff, but really improving and enhancing that, that combat, I think, is a is a huge thing that folks are gonna enjoy a lot. So Pete, I haven't had a chance to play Fallout 4 yet, but can you tell me about your character and, and how you're developing that just so I can get a few tips? Sure. Um, you know, we start you off and you have 28 points to assign to your specials, which are your, your base yeah. attribute strength and perception. Um, you know, my problem is when I play a role-playing game, I tend to be, try and be like uh, Jack of all trades. So you're so peanut butter. I, yeah, I try and sort <laughs> of, I, I never want anything to be too low. Um, but the really interesting thing, the more that I play the game, uh, and I think the thing the team did a great job on is this is this really interesting tension that every time I level up, I get angsty because I, I can't decide exactly what I want to do most because those level up points are so precious and there's so much stuff that I want to do. Right. And so, you know, I always drop points, for example, into gun nut as soon as I can because I love modifying my guns. But the thing that they do is there's multiple ranks for each perk. So gun nut, you can, you can level up multiple times, but they stretch out how far in between you're able to do those. So it's not like I can put it into gun nut and then I can do again, it again the next again, time. Again, again. Like they get, let you do gun nut and then they say, you know what, the next one, you're not gonna be able to do for, until you level up to, to level 14. And so I'm actually forced to wow. figure out all right, what else am I going to focus on? What else am I going to put my stuff into? Right. Um, and so I, I do a lot of stuff in and around crafting. I focus on armorer, which is a strength thing. I focus on science and um, gun nut. Uh, one of the things you focus on, I focus on a lot is you have a perk that allows you to get more resources out of the stuff that you break down. And you find that, um, here's, a little, here's a little tip for you um, folks who like to build your own stuff. Adhesives and screws are unbelievably important. Okay. They are incredibly, they're, they're rare, and you can't build anything to modify your armor or weapons without adhesives. Well, so duct tape, like, I don't get excited about anything in the game like I get excited about finding duct tape in the Because okay. when you find <laughs> duct tape, you're like, yes, now I can build that scope. Now I can put that extra mod on my armor or whatever it is. So I, I tend to put points into things that allow me to find those things better, which is cracking safes, getting into computer systems, or just scavenging better stuff when I when I find stuff. So it's a really interesting system that doesn't allow you to just say, I'm going to keep picking that perk over and over again. They actually force you, based on the requirements, to kind of spread out and to figure out, like, you can't just keep doing this over and over again, and you're going to kind of pick and choose from different abilities or, or different perks as you go along. I, I'm still having a ton of fun with it and figuring out kind of where I want to go. And sometimes I'll save a point because I know I'm going to unlock a requirement soon. Um, but that whole system, you know, we were talking before about Fallout 3 and the character system um, and, and just how it's different from Fallout 3. This is one way. It's very subtle, but playing through it, it's very different than previous games. But um, I think folks are really going to enjoy it when they start to figure out just how deep and, and really complicated it is. Well, much, much like uh, Fallout 4, this interview could go on for many, many hours. So I'm going to let you go. Pete Hines from Bethesda Software, congratulations to you and the team on shipping Fallout 4, and uh, thanks for watching.